Okay, so here's our terminology that I just went over. The anode is um, where the electrons are generated. It's got to be made from the more active metal. So if you remember back in experiment four of Gen Chem 1, we did a whole bunch of single displacement reactions and we ranked their activity and compared it to the textbook. So here's an example activity series. All right, and so what this shows us is according to this chart, this activity series, the most active things are at the top, the least active things are at the bottom. So since oxidation happens at the anode, we want the most active thing to be at the anode. So if I were making a battery out of, oh goodness, I don't know, what metals do I like today? Aluminum, because I have aluminum foil. So aluminum. And I don't know, what else would I have at home? Iron, I can find an iron nail, right? So if my choices are aluminum and iron, aluminum needs to be my anode, which means it's the one that's gonna be oxidized. And iron has to be my cathode because aluminum has a higher activity than iron does. So if aluminum is my cathode, it's the one that's going to be reduced. Okay, so these are all written as oxidation reactions. So that means to get to the reduction, I would flip the iron around. It means I need to dissolve my iron to make it into a two plus. If I pick iron, I gotta be careful because it can also form a three plus, right? And I don't know what that would do here. <laughs> but yeah, I could take some iron, dissolve it and try to get Fe two plus. And that could be my cathode. My anode would be aluminum and it would form aluminum three plus. It's relatively non-toxic, but I could make a battery that way. Okay, as long as I have a salt bridge. So the questions at the bottom of the screen are actually kind of important. When does the battery stop making power? So as we all know, the answer to that question is when I least can afford the batteries to die. You ever had your calculator die in the middle of a final? Me too. <laughs> no, the truth of it is though, that whenever one of the materials has run out is when your battery stops working. So if we go back and we look at the copper zinc cell here, the zinc metal is forming zinc ions. So if our zinc metal runs out, the battery stops. On the flip side, if we run out of copper two plus, because I've precipitated all of it into onto this plate of copper, then the battery will also stop. And then of course, I also told you batteries will short out if you don't have counter ions being added in. So that's another source of um, battery dying. This That happens by the way with your Duracell type batteries. Um, which are not wet batteries, but that can happen if you leave them in a drawer or a bowl or your pocket and some piece of metal completes the circuit. It'll drain it over time, also creates heat. So you might've experienced this. If you've ever put a nine volt battery in your pocket with your keys, it gets really hot really fast. So nine volt batteries have the anode and cathode both on the top. So a key can complete that circuit, um, but it's not using any of that electricity. So it just builds up as thermal heat and that hurts. So don't do it, okay? So I always kind of mention this as a safety measure. Make sure you're storing your batteries carefully so you're not just draining them or creating waste heat. Um, you don't want random stuff to complete that circuit. Um, you can fix a battery dying in a couple ways. We could replace the zinc strip. We could replace the copper ions. We could maybe clean up or replace the salt bridge. So those are some options. The rate of reaction does indeed depend on temperature and it depends on the specific reaction you're looking at on whether it's exothermic or endothermic. We are now equipped to calculate delta H for these processes and determine whether we want hot temperatures or cooler temperatures. Uh, engineers design batteries to work in the situation that you're going to use them in. So if, for example, 
I create an exothermic battery and then I try to put it into a car that runs at a really hot temperature, that battery efficiency is not going to be good. Okay. Dry batteries are things like Duracell batteries or Energizer or whatever brand you prefer, right? They look like this. Okay. So in a, in a dry battery, um, what we mean is like there's very little water present by that. So in a dry battery, the cathode is actually the little teeny cap at the top of the battery. And it is attached to a graphite rod, which is basically in our, it just is used to, tr to sort of carry electrons around. Um, the anode is actually the metal casing beneath the label. So purple represents the label that they put on there which actually doesn't usually cover the bottom. Um, so the anode is usually accessed at the bottom and the cathode is at the top. Inside of the casing is this gray black paste of manganese dioxide and ammonium chloride. So ammonium chloride is white, manganese dioxide is black, and then you have carbon, which is also black. So this paste is essentially Well, it's, it's, it's basically where the reduction happens and, and the graphite rod is used to carry those uh, electrons from the anode to the cathode, okay? And so if your battery is connected at one side and the other, then whatever device, your remote control, your Xbox controllers or whatever, accesses the power generated from doing that, okay? That's called an acid type battery because of course we know ammonium chloride is an acid. They don't last as long as alkaline type batteries, but they are a little bit cheaper because ammonium chloride is even cheaper than sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, which are also pretty cheap. Um, the bases are used for alkaline type because they do have a little bit longer lifetime. So when, when you put MnO2 and carbon all this in, in an acidic solution, it tends to degrade faster than it would in a basic solution. They both produce the same voltage. The difference just is, is in longevity. So you often see alkaline type batteries marketed as the premium kind that you would use for like digital cameras or other, other types of uh, electronic items that drain power quickly. Okay, and there is a substantial difference in the performance between an alkaline type battery and an acid type battery. It's worth noting though that name brand batteries make both kinds. So it's not like if you buy a Duracell, it's always an alkaline type. That's not the case, okay? Um, it says on the packaging somewhere which one it is. They both uh, produce the same voltage and they have the same size. It's just a matter of lifetime. If you want a battery that lasts a really long time, you use one of the kind that's like for a watch battery. Okay, and these have kind of a similar structure. There's a steel cathode at the top uh, and the outside casing of zinc is the anode. The, um, the reduction actually happens in this kind of paste mixture of mercury oxide and KOH. So as it turns out, these little watch batteries, which you find in hearing aids and car remote beepy things and some calculators and watches and stuff like that. They come in a variety of sizes and shapes and voltages and things, but it's always a lower voltage and it lasts a longer period of time. Okay. Um, these should never be disposed of in the landfill in your regular trash. Whereas regular Duracell type double A's, triple A's, nine volts, all those, can be thrown in the trash because these are less hazardous materials. Mercury, of course, is a major environmental pollutant, so you don't want to throw that in the trash. These are supposed to be recycled at specific facilities. So car batteries are another real life application. So car batteries are typically very concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, unless you're specially trained to handle it, I seriously do not recommend playing with sulfuric acid batteries. They're very dangerous. 
So if you see white stuff coming off your contacts on the top of your battery, that's solid sulfuric acid. The water has evaporated out uh, and it's just precipitated on your battery. Don't touch it. Okay, it's your safety tip for today. <laughs> um, so besides the sulfuric acid, there's also lead. So the reaction that happens is between lead and lead oxide and sulfuric acid. So in the forward direction is your discharge. Wow, that's not, that's not straight. Let's try that again. So the forward direction is your discharge cycle. So when your car starts, your battery is going in the forward direction. Then once your car is in motion, the water and the lead sulfate react together to charge the battery back up again. So rechargeable batteries have to be equilibrium reactions. Okay. Um, I want you to think about this. I told you the story about my car that would always die right as winter came. Ironically, that was in Florida. So we're not talking about like a huge change in temperature here, but it was enough. Like maybe it was 60 in November. <laughs> so if my car could no longer discharge when it gets cold, is a car battery endothermic or exothermic? So the way to fix it is to raise the temperature of the battery. So I just disconnect it as long as there's no solid sulfuric acid on it. And I bring it into the house and I let it sit till it warms up. Then I put it back in my car and suddenly the battery would work at least long enough to get me to work. Okay. Um, or to the auto parts store to get a new battery. So knowing that heating it up has an effect, we'll be able to tell us whether it's an endothermic or exothermic reaction. So I want you to do that as part of the learning check. That's an arrow. Once you're in motion, part of the design of a vehicle is that the wheels turning the axle will turn your alternator and your alternator, that motion, can regenerate some electricity. So that is, is how your car charges. As long as your alternator is functioning, it'll, it'll recharge your battery, okay? Um, the electronic components in your car are always drawing on the battery. So things like your radio, your lights, you know, stuff like that are always discharging the battery a little bit but while you're in motion, that recharges the battery. Most of the energy in your battery is during startup, right? To get the spark plugs to spark. Lithium ion batteries are one of the most prevalent kinds of batteries in our world. And so if you're on a laptop right now, you're probably using a lithium ion battery, unless your laptop is older than you. <laughs> most of you are, young enough that lithium ion batteries have been standard, but it used to be cadmium nickel batteries um, were common in laptops and other um, small devices like that. They're not as efficient. They don't stay charged for as long. So most of the time we see lithium ion batteries these days. This is an active area of research. People are trying to figure out how these batteries work so we can make them more efficient. So engineers are working on different techniques for building the batteries efficiently, the structure inside the batteries to, to prevent overcharge and, um, you know, kind of battery wear out. And yet, even though this is an active area of research and we've been using lithium ion batteries since mm, the late eighties, um, we still don't actually know everything about them. There's still work being done. Like, for example, a few years ago, there was a certain model of a certain popular device that would spontaneously catch on fire, so much so that, like, airlines wouldn't let people bring those devices on planes anymore. Um, that, that was a lithium-ion battery, and something about the way that it was structured was allowing heat to build up. So, yeah, we don't know everything about this, but here's the basics, okay? 
And also, here's how to save some cash on your phone batteries or your laptop or whatever. Okay, so lithium ion batteries are actually begin with a complex of lithium and cobalt. And the X means it's kind of like a random distribution of um, lithium ions that are attached to the cobalt oxide. So um, the range of how many lithiums varies from product to product and how old it is and stuff like that. But basically, it's got to be at least two. All right. So if we pretended it was a two here, two lithiums, one cobalt, two oxygens. The discharge cycle in the front, going the front way, so like when I'm using my laptop, it's discharging. We will form, we give off one lithium, so we would have, say, LiCoO2. We give off one lithium ion, which releases an electron. That electron powers my device. It lets me get to the internet. <laughs> when I plug in my computer, the reverse reaction is what's happening, right? So that's our charging cycle. So we take the lithium ion, the electron from the wall, and we reform our original complex. So because it's rechargeable, it's got to be in equilibrium. Now, during this process, what's actually being oxidized is the cobalt. So the lithium is always plus one. Um, but the cobalt is going from plus three to plus four. Okay. When, um, when you're recharging and it goes from plus four to plus three. There's a problem though. This equilibrium can be affected by something called overcharging. So you can imagine if I keep adding electrons on the product side, it's going to keep shifting it to the left and to the left and to the left. And since there's not actually a hard limit on how many lithiums you can attach here, it just keeps happening. Eventually, though, you're going to exceed the number of Li pluses you can fit on there comfortably. And you're going to get some side products, some byproducts, if you will. Cobalt oxide and, well, cobalt two oxide and lithium oxide are the products you get. And um, I used to have an example of this in the lab. I bought my son a Chromebook for $40 because um, you know, off of Facebook or whatever, because the person who had it before me had left it plugged in constantly, which causes overcharging. And um, it's pretty easy to fix. You just get a new battery. And so for like a grand total of $60, I got my son a Chromebook when he was in high school. Uh, the caption said 6,000. Oh, it just fixed itself. <laughs> so anyways, um, understanding battery chemistry can save you a bunch of cash, which is helpful. Um, overcharging happens when you keep things plugged into the wall beyond 100% charge. So just don't. Okay, there's a whole bunch of ways to deal with this. My son was clever about it. He would plug his phone in with a timer so he could still plug it in overnight, but the timer would turn it off at like two or three in the morning or whatever. And so he'd wake up to a fully charged phone that was not overcharged. I charge my phone while I'm sitting at my desk talking to you guys because I'm kind of more aware of it then. Um, and I don't leave it plugged in for too long. So there are, it used to be that if you left a phone plugged into the wall for even like a few minutes past 100%, it would become overcharged and you could actually feel the difference in the battery. Okay, so that Chromebook battery I kept and it feels really fat because this precipitate, the COOS and the LIOS have more volume to them than the complex up here. All right, and so you can actually feel when a battery is too fat. It probably, a lithium ion battery, it probably has just been overcharged. It's not reversible. So the only way to fix it is to, to replace that battery. The other way that you can overcharge something is if you're using it while it's plugged in. And I think we're all guilty of this to some extent. But what that does is you just build up a lot of heat because this reaction does produce heat. And uh, that will just degrade the quality of the battery. So you want to try to avoid that. 